I am going to begin sharing my screen, ladies. Okay, sounds great. Welcome to everyone who's joining us. It looks like we're at 45 people and counting. Welcome to the Main Street track. We're super excited for today. And we're gonna start with Deb Brown. So if everyone wants to click twice to maximize her presentation, that will make us smaller and you'll still be able to hear Deb, but you'll be able to see her presentation much bigger. Enjoy, go ahead, Deb. <laughs> Good morning. We're gonna be talking all things empty buildings. The tour of empty buildings, shared spaces, pop-ups, windows, roofless buildings, empty lots, quality of life, events, and finding entrepreneurs. There's going to be five places throughout the presentation where we'll stop and take questions. Now, you can put those questions in the chat box. And as she said, don't forget to maximize your screen by clicking on the presentation on my screen. So let's begin. It all started with a drive to a small town for a job interview. Going through town, I counted 14 empty buildings downtown. If I got this job as chamber director, you know I'd be responsible for filling them. I got the job. <laughs> Their one big manufacturer had moved to Mexico two years prior. 2,000 people out of work in a town of 8,000. 2,000 people without the money to shop at the stores downtown, and their worst fears had materialized. And the town had the negative belief that this would never get better. Our savior company had left. Businesses closed because they couldn't see a way forward. Building owners spent more time thinking about how they could use their empty buildings as a tax write-off or fill it with storage and try, instead of trying to fill it with them. No one wanted to talk about the empty buildings. No one. They were a sign of loss, and who wants to focus on that? Were these empty buildings really a problem? Your old way thinkers would say yes, and don't show them. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Don't let others out of town know about them. I just couldn't see how that was going to work. If no one was looking at the buildings, they were never going to get filled. If we continued to believe that this town had lost everything and we played that poor me game, we would never survive. So I said they were really an asset. We've got the opportunity for new businesses in town to support people who want to start a business in their town. And we're not a town full of losers. It was time to wake up and be the town that believed in itself. Let's showcase these buildings and fill them up. <laughs> Let's be proud and loud and tell the world we're doing this. Shame hides in the dark and we were ready for the light. Once I connected with realtors to identify and arrange access to buildings, I reached out and built two more important connections. I asked Joel, who owned a construction company, and Ed, the city manager, to go through a couple of buildings with me. Now, I didn't do it to ask them permission to have the tour of empty buildings. I wanted to hear what they said about any problems in the building and ask them how they would handle it. I did it to build a relationship with them, share my ideas and tell them what I was doing with the tour. And I really listened to their ideas about how to fix things and shared their answers too. By the time we were done, they were as excited as I was and they were thrilled to be asked for their opinion and their expertise. The old way was to never talk to the negative people. You know them, the committee of negativity. Who wants to talk to someone who seldom has something good to say? You imagine that they'll make fun of you and belittle you. You know, I even had imaginary conversations in my head with them. It was time to get out of my head. I had committed to making a difference in this new job and to help my new home. So I visited the guys at the coffee club. And yes, they poo-pooed my idea with, it'll never work. But I didn't let that sway me. I kept at them, asking a lot of questions like, why won't it work? What do I need to look out for? Finally, I asked one guy who had no desire to buy a building or even be positive about the tour. Don't you have a daughter that lives out of town? What would it be like if she moved back and started a business? His eyes lit up. He could care less about himself. But his kids and grandkids, that was his motivator. He finally had a good reason to listen to me. And he spoke up and said, you can guarantee that kind of thing? <laughs> I told him I couldn't guarantee that kind of stuff. But I could guarantee that it was more of a possibility than what he had if we did nothing. 
Those little guys at the coffee club began sharing about the empty buildings. And here's something for you to remember. These people are members of your community too. For most of us, we serve together with those in the Committee of Negativity in other ways, at church, on boards, at events, at work. And we don't always disagree about everything. Their reactions are worth hearing and seeing. So try your best, be kind. And if they are truly toxic about everything, you'll know you've given your best shot. Then you can avoid them. I made up the tour of empty buildings. I already knew it could be successful. I just felt it. And I knew we'd have to do it all together. And if we're going to work together, we need to help each other. Now, the realtors have been trying for two years to fill these empty buildings. But with the attitude around town, they were getting nowhere. We went ahead and scheduled the tour of empty buildings. And it wasn't just me showing people around. It was the local engineering company making maps for people. It was the stores handing out postcards to visitors. It was posters all around town. It was friends posting on Facebook. It was the people all over town telling each other. It was the owner and realtor in the building the day of the tour. The retired chamber people sharing the history of the building and suggesting ideas. The local grocery store offering coffee after the tour. And it was talked about everywhere. Social media, newspaper, radio, in homes, on phones, and in person. One owner of three storefronts in a row vacillated between being on the tour and not being on the tour. In the end, he put up a sign that directed people to Al the Barber down the street for more info. Uh, I was busy trying to fill the small space next to his shop. And those three storefronts are still empty today. The day of the tour came and 44 people attended. Now we considered that a success. Several people talked about buying buildings and starting new buildings. At the wrap-up coffee gathering, everybody was excited. So how did we fill those buildings? Yeah, there's a secret sauce. And it's keep talking about it. The people on the tour looked at the buildings. They asked a lot of questions, took some pictures. Everybody was complimentary. But the most important thing that they did was keep talking about it. Now, no one bought buildings that night but lots more people heard about it. Did you know it takes seven times to hear something before it registers? It's called the rule of seven, and it says consumers must hear about something seven times before they take action. A new plumbing company bought the closing plumbing company. They didn't come to the tour, but they'd heard the business was for sale. Hearing about the tour was just another way they heard about it. A new health-related business bought a long-standing empty building. The new owner is a resident and had not realized the building was for sale. It inspired her to start her own business, hiring staff and bringing on other healthcare specialists. A Hispanic church opened in the old public health building and they would not have known about it except for the tour. Two new clothing stores for teens opened. One business only lasted a few months, but the other business participated in the incubator project and one year later, they went on to buy a building three times the size. They were not on the tour, but they heard about it from the Hispanic church pastor. A new Mexican grocery store opened in a building that the owners had bought, and it went out of business after two years. Failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's an opportunity to try your ideas out, see if they work, and adjust if they don't. A vintage store owned, a vintage store owned by the woman with dark hair in the picture above opened. Now, I first visited her at another outdoor, outdoor event where she was a vendor. I asked her to look at our incubator project, and she did. She loved the town so much, she just bought a building. Nancy's law office was bought, and today it's a tattoo shop. Now, Nancy didn't want to put another for sale sign up in her building. She was sensitive to the fact that there were so many signs already up. However, she needed to clean out her deceased husband's law office building. This spurred her into action, and it also got her building sold. Every time something happened, a building was sold or rented, we made a big deal out of it. If we heard someone was looking at a building, we shared that. We just kept talking. And it really did make all the difference in the world. Ten of those 12 buildings were rented or sold to a new business. 
One story that shows how important the follow-up process is our incubator, informal incubator project. Now we had a building owner that had several buildings downtown. I approached them with the incubator project idea. Put your buildings in the program and you offer three months free rent and reduce rent for the rest of the year. The chamber agreed to help the businesses that went into those bu buildings with marketing and the small business development center came in to help the business with creating a business plan on the go. Now the benefits to the owner, at least someone else was paying the utilities. Every building needs love and this provided that. The business could leave at any time. Remember, it's a way to test out the business idea or they could stay if they wanted. Did it work? Yep. We had this amazing Italian restaurant and they lasted a year and they'd still be there if the husband wasn't offered a job three times his normal salary in another state. Family always comes first and that's in the code of ethics in our town. No worries though. Oops, sorry. I skipped one. No worries though. There was a Mexican grocery store downtown that wanted to open a restaurant, but they were saving to buy a commercial hood. In the meantime, they took advantage of the incubator project for one year. The last business to be there was a new and used store with an artist who collected the most unique things. She grew and moved to a new by city. Chicago style rented the other building under the incubator project. A year later, she bought a building in that same block and expanded it to three times bigger. We talked about her earlier. Now, all this turnover is a natural process, like breathing, which is better than empty buildings. Could we save the movie theater? It was one of the buildings on the tour. My first week on the job, the theater closed. How frustrating. Well, a group of us got together, we formed a 501c3 and started raising money. The high school students made us some, some movie trailers and they named our group HERO, which stands for Help, Entertain and Restore Organization. We had to buy the building, a national bank owned it, and we tried to contact the local person, but just never got an answer. I'm gonna tell you that was frustrating, but I had an idea. I sent an email to the marketing marketing director in San Francisco. I shared my story with him and my social media credentials. I also said I would not want to share something bad about their bank, not returning our calls. Don't you know, the next day I received an email stating they'd be happy to sell the building for half the listed cost and consider that other half a donation. And that same day, the local person called us too, and we bought the building. We put out an open call in the community to come and help clean the place up. People came when they could and they worked for free. Now we needed ideas for ways to raise money besides the usual bake sales and frankly begging. Alumni clubs are kind of a big deal in our town. So we made up the idea to sell the seats at $300 a pop to lots of individuals, nonprofits, alumni clubs, and businesses. It was a big chunk of the funds raised. They didn't actually get the seats. They did receive a plaque on the back with their name on it. It was a small but meaningful way for more people to participate. We played dodgeball for donations. By the way, this is the first group of people that got together and said, let's save the building. And in 16 months, we raised a quarter of a million dollars in small donation amounts. We bought the building, revitalized it, added digital equipment and hired staff. It was important to pay people to work there. We wanted to create economic development in our town. Now, you could totally do a tour as well. Many towns have. Natchez, Mississippi does it every year. Many of the towns called us and asked for permission to do a tour. And of course I said, yes. In fact, we have since developed a toolkit that walks people through all the steps. And because you're attending this conference, Radically Rural, you'll receive 25% off the cost. Charlottesville, Australia, told us they actually add a few empty buildings to their regular tour of town every year. Crow's Nest Pass is a collection of five mountain towns that make up the municipality of Crow's Nest Pass. Population, 
5,600. 11 commercial spaces were for sale or for rent. You could come and go as you wish, see one or see them all. You could pick up a map or print one from home. They did add pop-up boutiques and refreshments and put yellow flags on participating businesses. Vineland, New Jersey hosted what is plainly described as a vacancy tour for real estate brokers and business developers. After lunch, a description of an improved future for Landis Avenue, those assembled were shuttled around to inspect the boarded up storefronts. Excuse me. <coughs> Main Street in that area had developed a fact sheet about each property with the information about incentives that qualified newcomers could tap into. But, you know, there was objections, right? Why are some building owners against renting or selling? Why do the owners keep their buildings empty? Well, not all of them do. <coughs> Sorry, dry weather, huh? Some owners use it for storage, and it looks like an episode of Hoarders. Or the owner lives out of town, and it's hard to reach, and simply doesn't really care. Or the owner likes it empty for a tax write-off. Perhaps a corporation owns it, and they don't care either. Some owners had good intentions, but just not enough money. One of the most common issues we hear about are absentee and reluctant building owners. These can be the people who don't live in town or maybe never lived in town. Often they can be corporations that are completely unresponsive. And I'll have some ideas for dealing with them when we talk about ordinances. Sometimes they are local, but they just don't seem to ever do anything with their buildings. Well, first of all, when was the last time you talked to them? Sometimes we think we've talked to them, but we've just driven by the building and got frustrated about the appearance and said we were going to talk to them. Then life takes over and we forget. <coughs> I am so sorry. Call them up and invite them to coffee and talk about the big goal, the future, how their buildings could be part of it. Talk about their grandkids. Use activities and projects like a tour of empty buildings as an excuse to reach out even if they aren't participating. Another common problem is building owners who are asking for rents that are much too high. And often this is because the building owner is from a larger city where these rents make sense. Here's how one small town dealt with that issue. Julie Worry took rent negotiation authority from the building owners and she filled buildings. She works in Rocky Ford, Colorado, population 3,200 as the economic development director there. She called the empty building owners, learned everything about the buildings, and found out what they wanted for rent. <coughs> she then offered to get the buildings rented, but only if they gave her the authority to decide what the rent should be. Well, only one building owner said yes. He had one building with four storefronts, and he was an out-of-town owner. And so, for example, one storefront, he wanted $450 per month. And Julie knew someone who wanted to open a coffee shop, but a lot of plumbing work would have to be done first. Julie had the woman pay the owner $100 in rent and use the other $350 to pay against the plumbing until she had recovered her cost. It took her 18 months to pay it off, and Julie filled all four storefronts that way. Now, you can imagine the other building owners now wanted Julie's help. Even then, most were reluctant to give up control over their rent. So it was still some hard work to get them to agree. In her 10 years at Rocky Ford, she helped 17 mom and pop businesses open. 17. Centerville, South Dakota adopted a local vacant building ordinance that makes it less desirable to use empty spaces for cheap storage. Fees are charged for rundown, dilapidated properties to discourage absent property owners from holding on to those properties that could be turned into businesses. In Fayetteville, North Carolina, now that's a city with 200,000 population, but you can think about this, targeted vacant commercial properties in their downtown and started requiring inspection by the fire department every six months. Now, originally, they had proposed a $1,000 registration fee, which would have been waived for owners actively listing their properties at or near fair market prices. 
Sadly, the real estate agents group opposed that. So be sure to talk to your realtors before you start something like this. This they eventually got it to work and their ordinance is posted online. So Calendar, Iowa and Stanhope, Iowa, both small, small towns have changed their city code and added a property maintenance code for both, both the exterior and interior of the buildings. Now, I like this because it sets forth a really detailed plan of action, a fine structure, and a no-nonsense, do this or we're going to take the building from you attitude. Some empty lots stay empty because the lot owners won't budge. Well, go for small requests, temporary requests first. Look for something that might line up with their interests. Could it be art or fun or commerce, a throwback to what used to be? You could say, you gave us this idea when you said it used to be a clothing store where we sold football jerseys for our local school. Take your time. Show the owner it works with other small examples. Then you can scale up to longer and more intensive ideas. All right, let's talk. What questions do you have? This is a great time to answer questions. So go refill your coffee cup if you need to. Go to the bathroom. Let me stop sharing so I can see the chat room. Hi, everybody. Oh, look at all of this. Lots of comments. Thank you, everybody. Let's see. Yeah, the reduced rent was not subsidized. The, the people that rented it paid the utilities. And the town that had the fire inspections twice a year, was um, uh, stuck on stupid there. Hold on. North Carolina, I believe. I'll look it up for you. Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm turned down to community owned buildings like in the incubator model. So, first of all, in the incubator project, it was owned by private citizens, it wasn't owned by the community. Um, and I, you know, some cooperatives are owned by the city and those seem to be working pretty well. Um, yes, the free rent was for three months, Sharon. Uh, the first three months were free, reduced rent for the rest of the year. Um, let's see. Oh, Sean, I love that. Colored, cheery lighting inside. We're going to talk about windows here in a little bit. So I'll share some other ideas too. And what other businesses benefited from the incubator project? Good question. When you put a group of businesses downtown that actually have business in them, everybody around them benefits. So for example, the restaurants, bring more people downtown to see the other shops that may be retail or even the service related businesses. Ah, and the community, a few cents to throw in the ring. So you want to start your fledgling entrepreneur with a dream to invest in properties to build community. That's a really good question. She wants to know if she should start a nonprofit, apply for grants or find private investors or both. I think you need to gather your crowd and talk with your friends that have this same kind of idea and see where it can go. They'll have lots of ideas too. And you'll reach out and build your connections to find the people that could actually answer that question a whole lot better than I can. It might involve some lawyers and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, yeah, Susan, a fire in a vacant building could take out the whole downtown. And what is the best way to message to engage non-responsive landowners? If they're local, somebody knows who they are. Find use your connections to find who actually knows them. If it's a corporation, I gave that example of the uh, national bank that wouldn't respond. And I just used a little muscle to talk about um, my social media standing um, that I've spent many years building. So that seemed to work. This is, I, I know Becky talked about the idea friendly method this morning, and it's a perfect way to answer a lot of these questions to gather your crowd and get started. Let's see. 
Making building owners will not have to agree to. Oh, love that. So um, Charles said they're working on an ordinance with their town around vacant buildings. Owners will not have to pay a fine if they agree to participate in a project like the incubator project. And Lynn wants to know, do we have any success stories about shared workspaces using a previously vacant building? Um, Yes, actually in my town, frankly, there was an empty building next to a local bar and the bar owner just didn't want to put that much effort into fixing it up until her friend came to her and said, I want to start a co-working place. Can you help me? So actually asking for help helped to open up this co-working space. Funny, we, we just don't want to ask for help. You'd be surprised how that might make a difference. There's a lot of questions. They're going to save the chat for me. So um, as possible, I'll figure out how to get answers back to you. And if you really want to know, you can email me at deb at saveyour.town. And I happily answer all the emails. Now let's go back to the next section, please. Slideshow. There we go. Oop, wrong thing, sorry. Funny how the computer works, isn't it? So the single best strategy. Next, I wanna share that. The best way to fill empty building with businesses is not the same old one building, one business strategy. The single best strategy is to divide the buildings up. Now this is Cops Common, Napanee, Indiana. It's an old factory with 100,000 square feet of space, and it sat empty for years. These are the people that made Hoover cabinets. There was little chance another manufacturer was going to swoop in and fill it all up. So a local family bought the factory. They have opened it up a little bit at a time for smaller uses. There's a retail space, an ice cream shop, all kinds of cool and fun things. They now have nine businesses large and small event spaces, and a business center. And there's still a lot more room to grow in the future. So rather than waiting until someone was ready to fill the whole thing, they just split it up and now they've got a thriving retail space. You could make a space that multiple businesses can divide and share. It can be a space carefully designed for compatible small retail shops like Kathy Lloyd from Washington, Iowa shared with us. This building was too big for one retail store and it sat empty for quite a while. Then a group of women brainstormed, they gathered their crowd and they created the village. Look at how nice this is. The table, the wall, the tree, the boutique, all of them are stores. It's a perfect way for a person going into business for themselves to try out their idea and just test the market. Low investment and not thousands of dollars to buy a building, fix it up, purchase inventory, and then hope someone comes in and buys. Why not try a seasonal split? Besides splitting up the spaces inside of buildings, you can split the buildings by time. So there are buildings that are large and only used part of the year. The boat storage location in Roscommon County, Michigan is a great example of that. Uh, this building's full in winter, but empty in summer. I was there on an embedded community experience and got to tour this building with a group of local people. Well, we quickly found a way, they did, to use it in the summer. They brainstormed. They divided the building up and offered individual spaces to local home-based businesses and crafters. So this gave them the opportunity to try their idea out, to have their business in front of tourists during the season. Then at the end of summer, the tiny businesses pack up and the boats get the building back all winter long. You could try some temporary small solutions. Now this space was used during ladies night out. Mrs. Anderson crochets beautiful scarves, hats, gloves, and more. She sold out during this event. However, she found out that she doesn't want a store as producing all that product was just too time consuming and not possible. But she does have pieces in different stores around town. You could use a space that's already for rent. Try a pop-up store. 
This could be another store's second store. It could be a home business trying out their products in a trial run, or even a nonprofit that sells things. This is one of my favorite spaces. And this was in an empty space inside the coffee shop in a store in Watertown, Minnesota. They actually used the wall to feature photos from a local photographer until they could rent it out. Now you could do this in any business with a blank wall and it doesn't have to be retail or food. It could be service too. Let's talk about our windows a little bit here. Now here's an example from Longview, Texas. Decals were put on the windows of vacant buildings to show a 3D view of what those buildings could house, like a hardware store or a furniture store. Now this $3,000 project was paid for with funds raised in a color run. Durango, Colorado used vinyl window decals and they depicted historic scenes for, his, for their vacant properties downtown. You think this is real? Hollis, Oklahoma, population 2,060 people just made up this great idea and look closely at this picture. No, it's not a barber shop. It just looks like one. Even the barber pole wall is just a printed banner hung inside. Well, at least make it look better. This is in Columbiana, Ohio. When this broken window was boarded up, it was waiting for a business to come here and look like this. Now, the owner didn't want to put a new window in until he rented the building. That way, he could put in one that suited the new renter. Well, we suggested he change that idea. A local artist was hired to paint this scene and actually worked on this painting during an outdoor festival downtown. Lots of people got to enjoy watching him work and got to tour the building as well. And this space is now filled. So you don't have any money? You can do this one. Your kids could do this. We all know how to make snowflakes. This could also be an intergenerational project. How about it? So we're going to talk again. Questions? I want to hear about your windows. I want to know what kind of pop-ups you've been doing. Yes, Becky, even during the pandemic, these ideas rock. I agree. Ah, flowers help it dress up as well. Ah, let's see. Kate says Winthrop, Maine did something similar. Her aunt sells her aprons, quilts, and other fabric art mm, at Freckle Savage Company. Wow, that's smart. Better than having to find her own space or going solely online. So she gets to do a little bit of everything. That's awesome. Caroline hosts a holiday pop-up shop between Thanksgiving and Christmas in downtown Albion. It gives local makers an opportunity to sell in the space during the holiday season. I love that. Are you hosting this pop-up shop in another business or an empty building? Where are you hosting it at? Windows on the future. Great idea, Michelle. We like to see what people think the future is going to look like. And Lander has different locations where people are sharing. Let's see. Candy store. Shannon. Oh, I've been to Shannon's candy store in Keene. And they try for at least three month increments for pop ups. And Caroline said the pop up is in a vacant building. Great way to showcase your vacant building as well. So, Deneen rented a large warehouse type space, then divided it into artist spacers. Spaces, kind of like an arts incubator. That's a brilliant idea. Or an arts uh, maker space. Let's see. Kathleen, they've considered partnering with Ray's, a national labor organization. Oh, to convert her store into a food pantry on the days they're closed. So she's not closing her store. She's just going to use the space in a smart way. Love that. Lori is renting for community space, events, parties, weddings. Lots of great ideas, guys. Wow. I hope you're all taking notes because they're sure sharing till the cows come home. And Kathleen has figured out how to receive a grant to get all those costs covered. There's money out there for helping to feed people that need to be fed. Um, that's pretty sweet. Michelle has a retail front space called Alchemy. An old barn that Philbrook Pace in Bethel, Maine. 
I love it. Becky, I agree. So smart to get multiple uses out of one space. That's just brilliant. Let's go to the next section. Oops. I'll figure it out here. Give me a moment. There we go. We're going to talk about roofless buildings and empty lots. Now, I'm sure you folks have seen a few roofless buildings and empty lots. And don't despair because there's a lot to use for them, too. Look at this picture close. This is Wenatchee, Washington. Those three buildings in the middle, they look real, don't they? Well, they're not. Why not build a facade to cover up that empty lot? It lets people dream about what kind of business they could put there. But it also fills a hole, much like a dentist does in your mouth when you're missing a tooth. And if you look closely, there are tables and chairs in front too, so you could get your coffee and go sit outside. Porterdale, Georgia had a huge community center and a gymnasium, 12,000 square feet, and it burned down years ago. Now with a town of 1,200 people, it really was a huge eyesore. Well, here it is today. They stabilized just the outside, the outer brick shell, and it's now an event space that has hosted concerts and food festivals and weddings. It's a great transformation. There are lots of ways they could use that even during the week, maybe food trucks or have people bring their chairs and just have their lunch outside. Now, the best part of this story is that this spot was filled by the folks that don't really want change and still do things the old way. Belfu, South Dakota had two opposing groups of people who want things done. When I was on a tour there, the busy group walked right past this area and I stopped them and said, hey, 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 what is this? And they said, oh, that other group did that. Well, you know, a great way to build bridges is to be open to all the ideas and everyone's con contribution. In Henrietta, Texas, they don't spray the ditches along the highway into town so the wildflowers will grow. It's a beautiful setting with flowers native to the area. An older gentleman in Clark, South Dakota, will drop native wildflower seeds on newly empty lots. And by the following year, it's filled with flowers. If you use the hashtag love that lot, you can follow it on Twitter and see lots of examples of lots that have been changed. Take your empty lot and be selfie worthy, be different. Brandon, Iowa has the world's largest frying pan or skillet to some of you, and it's on an empty lot. There might be 500 people in that town. It's right off a big highway and lots of people stop by. And they also stop by the restaurant to eat, too. Well, the politicians are in town right now taking selfies and standing in line for burgers. Tishomingo, Oklahoma, turned this empty lot into this gorgeous spot, and it includes a public restroom. It's just simply beautiful. Well, how about creating an outdoor museum? And, you know, it could be anything. There are old cars in Nebraska that are buried a quarter of the way up and they stand tire to tire. It's called car hinge. Well, how about a rusted tractor graveyard? What weather resistant or happily rusty artifacts would tell the story of your town? Create a place for music and entertainment. Now this is a Vela Bank Park in my town. The entire corner of half a block was torn down after several old buildings had burned. So the bank created a big park with a stage that has place to plug your electronics in for concerts and events. And there's no charge to use it either. The Trust for Public Land is working to bring free fitness zone areas to parks across the nation, creating a fun, accessible, and social environment where people can enjoy getting fit. This would totally work on an empty lot. And there's a few health companies out there that are giving grants for exactly this kind of thing. How about a living room? Make your empty lot comfier and home-like. Hold conversations there. 
Now this was a temporary art community project, but it makes perfect sense to try for a longer time, maybe even in a roofless building. Here's a cool conversion of a roofless building. The Center for Rural Affairs helped make a theater out of a former storefront in Lyons, Nebraska. The whole front of this building folds down over the street and looks like this. The bleacher style seating rolls out and they haul the screen in behind a tractor into the street to form an outdoor theater. You can sit in the bleachers or bring your own chairs. That's a small town way of thinking, isn't it? 107 Grand is a roofless building in Paris, finding a new life as a beer garden. And doesn't a beer garden sound so much more entertaining than just building with no roof? It's Paris, Texas, by the way. And look how beautiful and inviting this looks. Now the kitchen in the back is a tiny building built right into that roofless space. Sometimes it takes a long time to make something beautiful out of an empty lot. Cuba, Missouri worked on one empty lot park for more than 20 years, just slowly making it beautiful. And here it is today. Indeed, it is simply lovely. I really like this idea. Link Detroit is turning vacant lots into sponges for storm water. Now this is a rendering of one of the bioretention gardens in their Warrendale neighborhood. Simply beautiful, great way to use flowers and help with storm water. I love this idea of a dog park and it actually becomes a central gathering place in your town. Now, this is a dog playing in a pocket park in Mexico City. You can do this in anywhere. Here's a block long empty lot when a business burned down and it sat empty for 10 years in a small town of Tynesta, Pennsylvania, population 500. Originally, they were looking for one business to fill that empty space. Here's what it looks like today. The Economic Development Group used inexpensive garden sheds to create a bunch of tiny business spaces. And then they built false 1800 style facades to match the buildings in town. And this is kind of a business incubator. It would work in a roofless building just as well as an empty lot. It's really inexpensive to rent a space. There is a waiting list. Uh, one woman makes American dog clothes. There's a baker from another town that sells baked goods. The winery from out of town comes in and sells their product. There's a restaurant in there. There's a guy with fishing lures, all kinds of really cool things and plenty of places to sit in the middle and listen to live music if they choose to do that. Pascagoula, Mississippi had this big old dirty lot in town. And after Hurricane Katrina, somebody had a great idea to use the leftover housing from FEMA to build out this location called Anchor Square. And they put a deck around it too. You know, they just made this idea up. This is the green space. You see it, isn't it beautiful? It's a place where you could have trying your ideas out. There are small tents, there are nonprofits, there are people that have this idea and they wanna try it out. And this is actually your pipeline to continue to fill those anchor square buildings as well. These neighbors in Minneapolis got together to buy vacant buildings. They wanted to rent to bakers and brewers because they didn't have any in their neighborhood. So that's what they did. It's a cooperative venture. Any Minnesota resident could join the co-op for $1,000 and invest even more through the purchase of different classes of non-voting stock. I think it's brilliant. Look at all these people just hanging out on a Saturday. Well, I'm assuming it's a Saturday, but it sure looks like a lot of fun. Now let's go to questions again and stories. How are you sharing your empty lots and your roofless buildings? Let's see. Oh yeah, the Market Village is in Tynesta, Pennsylvania. 
Thanks, Susan, for asking. Yes, Beth, pollinator food. That's perfect for those ditches and empty lots to fill them up with flowers. Murals, mm, wall dogs. Now, wall dogs came to our town and worked on the murals out at the county fairgrounds. And there's a link for that too, if you guys are interested in the wall dogs. They're fascinating volunteer folks. And I'm looking to see if anybody else has stories about what they're doing. Yes, Sean, nothing happening with empty buildings in Berlin. Well, now you can make something happen. There's lots of room for ideas. I forget you guys are about 10 seconds behind me, so I'll be a little more patient. So Renegade Spark is an art project putting up photo booths in a city park on Main Street. Well, that's pretty cool. Any stories of towns that have transitioned from cars to walking? If you follow strong towns, they talk a lot about um, not using cars and changing your downtown to walking areas. It's where the uh, roundabouts play an important role because you can have something in the middle of the roundabout and it does slow down traffic as well. That's strong towns and you can Google them and find them. They have lots of stories. Uh, Berlin, sorry, Lisa. Cuesta Farmer's Market is happening in an empty lot. Thank you, Ms. McGee. I'll wait a couple of more seconds. Anybody else? Again, if you'd like to email your story, we do share them. Please do send them and send some pictures to deb at saveyour.town. And let's continue here. I want to share my screen again. Now we're going to get a little more serious. Improving the quality of life for your locals will fill more empty buildings than bringing in businesses from the outside. Please don't be afraid to think, what if we did this? And encourage others to think that way too. Your attitude about your town matters. What you believe, you'll see. And start by talking to people like you who want to save your buildings and your whole town. You're going to hear lots of ideas and you want to encourage all of them. So what if one or two fail? It's just a test of what works and what doesn't and an opportunity to adjust. Carry your positive attitude forward and start looking for the possibilities. Hmm, murals are a great way to dress up your town. And it's not only great for tourism, it's great for your locals. Remember, if your locals love living in your town, so will everybody else. Now, this is in Saginaw, Texas, and it's a fun way to honor those old buildings. You can paint or prepare a mural on the side of another building. This one looks fun, like the trucks are kind of real. You could try a 3D mural as well. Oakwood, Ohio celebrated 100 years and included this mural on the side of a building. I kind of think they like airplanes. Now, what local person in your town has a passion for something, anything? See if they might sponsor a mural with their, about their passion. It could be tractors or horses or the boys club or anything. Led South Dakota, Jamie Gilcrease shared this picture with us. And this one's pretty easy to duplicate, and it looks great on the side of a tough-looking building. Now, maybe you have a building that's going to come down. Why not put a mural on the side of it? Make it pretty for a while. It doesn't have to be a permanent thing. <laughs> I was visiting family and saw this mural. And, you know, there's a ton of angel wing murals around the United States. How could you make something like that work for your town? Now we're going to visit about banners a little bit. The county courthouse in Warren County, Iowa was torn down and they put this big fence around the entire block while they were building a new courthouse. They're still building a new courthouse. So they decided to put banners up around the square. 
Some were directly related to economic development in their county. History was another choice about famous things in the area and not always buildings. Activities in the county are on banners too. Now, Warren County's known, Indianola is known for their world famous balloon races. And just a little side note, they used to land and take off from a field behind my grandmother's house. Talk about exciting when I was a kid. Concerts will come back. I'm sure they will one day. Meanwhile, put up some banners and talk about hometown pride. Now here's something for the kids. And this is one of the oldest little leagues west of the Mississippi. That's something to be proud about. And there are banners representing all the towns in the county. Now, this is an ongoing project, and it can be funded in several ways. You could do typical fundraising, or individual people pay for it. Uh, cities might include it in their budget. And we're going to talk about fundraising in our Q&A section here in a little bit. Let's carry on and talk about art. If you can't afford to divide a building, or you can't fill them with businesses yet, fill them with art. The top part of this building is empty and it needs a lot of work. The old windows were boarded up and they look like boarded up windows, awful. So the community vitality director found a program involving students at the University of Iowa and they came up with this idea. Large pieces of wood were painted by citizen volunteers. They laid it out like paint by number and they are in funky bright colors and they feature important people and things in my town in Webster City. It's amazing what a string of lights will do for any location. It helps make your downtown not only pretty, but safer at night. And take a look at solar, solar lights. They don't require electricity and they're a great alternative. Art on the Walls. This is a coffee shop in Avon, Minnesota. In Goffstown, New Hampshire, each quarter they install the works of local artists in area businesses. And they open it whenever there's a long-term vacancy or a short-term need. It operates as a co-op with artists staffing it as volunteers. And you know, art doesn't have to go into just retail stores either. It could be in your insurance offices or beauty salons, even the chamber office. It's a great way to cross-pollinate people. So let's do talk a little bit about how you could raise money. I'll stop sharing. Let's come back to you guys. Anybody have idea about fundraising? Oh, I love that. Local pizza shop in Keene made angelines <laughs> look like cheese and pizza toppings. Oh, I love it. With melty cheese halo. And thank you for sharing the Instagram link for that. Uh, Missy Mitch is kiva.org, K-I-V-A dot org. And you can make small contributions to help other folks out that need some fundraising help. And I believe you can put yourself up there as well. Solar and energy. That's right. Let's see. This selectman has good qualities like tremendous devotion to fighting climate change, by investing in solar and energy efficiency. So it's not about just voting him out. I think I missed part of that conversation. But it's good to know who's running for office and what they're going to do for your community, too. We won't talk about politics. Let's see. Oh, people are talking about turning old schools into community centers. They can do that. Walkout Wednesday that features local art and local shops from five to seven for the community to walk around. Oh, brilliant. Getting to know spaces, artists, and the shops they're walking in. And Abby wants to know the pros and cons of using a vacant lot rather than keeping it ready for a new building. Why can't you do both? There's nothing that says that vacant lot, whatever your idea you have for there, has to be permanent. It can be temporary and bring even more attention to the lot and to the area. Oh, liability and insurance. That's always a big one, isn't it? Um, I'm going to share about that in a little bit, Becky. When we start talking about events, I'll bring that up. 
Ah, gallery walks are on hold around here because of COVID. Well, how could you do that and make it um, easier and better? Social distancing, wear your mask, or maybe you do it online. Maybe you create an Instagram account just for that and showcase artist work in shops. Ah, and Becky says the market village in Tynesta use shed so they can move them if the lot sold. Well, that's brilliant too. Hmm. Fundraising. Let me give you a couple ideas. We mentioned earlier the color run. So uh, people participate and pay to participate and the proceeds could be used for whatever you want. And what's pretty popular in small towns in Iowa is a 50-50 raffle. So somebody wins half the money, you sell the raffle tickets, and somebody wins half the money and the other half goes for a project. In the town that um, I grew up in, Hampton, Iowa, every year at Thanksgiving time, they sell $100 tickets, and I think they sell about 250 of them, um, and somebody wins $10,000. One person wins $10,000. There's a lots of other small amounts, and the rest goes for community projects in the community. Oh, I love that. Brattleboro um, is about to launch a Battleship Game Board Passport for their downtown walk next month. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, let's go on to the next section. Let's share that. Here we go. Events actually add to quality of life. People want to live where there are things to do. So hold events, but not your regular all planned out by the Chamber of Commerce kind of events. Let's try something a little bit different. And I'm going to share with you some events we did at our chamber um, that were different. RBTV. <laughs> Every year, the state's best known TV station travels in an RV to four towns during the week before the biggest college game in the state, Iowa versus Iowa State. Well, we got invited to participate one year. And these are two of the sports guys from the TV station. Of course, we gave them t-shirts to wear. And they were t-shirts that Google had made for us for another promotion about getting your business online. Well, the guys love them because they were soft and they fit. And we love seeing our town name on the TV station. RVTV is a huge event in Iowa. And we actually expected 5,000 people to come downtown. And it was my job to organize it. Ha! Well, I planned the map out. I found some food vendors. And I left the rest up to the community. I simply asked them, what do you want? And then I let them do it. I would not have thought of bar stool races at all. Normally, events take one year to plan. There's a lot to do. And when you're planning an event that 6,000 people will come to, it takes a lot. And yes, 6,000 people did come. And it involves lots of committees and meetings. Well, we broke that rule. We planned it in two months. And I didn't plan it at all. Remember the town answered my call. I asked them what they want. And they made it all work. And every idea they had, we said yes to just make it work. And word got around that everyone was welcome and could come set up. The few requirements were, we would let you know where your space would be to make it fun, no obscenities, no nudity, and be respectful. By taking away the committees and meetings, we also took away the boredom and drudgery of planning. Each group of people were excited that they got to go do their own idea and their friends and family would help them. This was to be fun, wear your favorite team colors, stay all day, have a drink or not, tailgate, eat bacon, party with your friends and family. I thought some of my board was going to have a heart attack when I told them all the things I said yes to. I would not have thought about adult tug of war or RVs downtown tailgating or a nickel scramble. 
by letting the community plan it, more people attended, more people participated, and our empty buildings and lots in entire downtown was highlighted. Yes, we had a bacon eating contest, and it wasn't our idea either. It was a local business who processes bacon and sells it all over the U.S. They cooked an awful lot of bacon, and it all got shared with the crowd. It was their investment into the success of the event. There were lots of ideas from lots of people, and we said yes to almost all of them. We jam-packed the streets and the downtown park area with activities and games and food and drinks. And yes, tailgating at one end. Indeed, it was a party. There was a chili cook-off. It was one of the first ideas proposed was this chili cook-off. And the guy who suggested it was so surprised. He was sure I was going to say no. He was also surprised that I asked him, how are you going to make it happen? Well, it was his idea. He could bring it all together. And the TV guys did taste some of the, do some of the taste testing. And after the awards, anybody could have a bowl of chili for free. Human Foosball, a local church youth group, thought it would be fun to bring their human foosball game. And we agreed. It looks just like a foosball table, only bigger and with humans kicking the ball. It did get interesting. They played that game during the entire event and we left it up to them and their sponsor on how to organize it all. The sponsor was a local insurance company. Liability was taken care of by them and no one got hurt or sued. Now, Junk Fest was dreamt up by me and Mike a local antique expert and retired store owner. We wanted to bring people to town to buy junk, refurnish, rehab, antique, old stuff. It's in high demand and it really does bring out a lot of shoppers. Right now, Junk Fest is a yearly event and that would not have happened if the chamber hadn't partnered with a private business who was the expert in this type of event. Yes, he shared in the revenue. His knowledge of who and how to market it to made this a success. My board said I couldn't do that. I couldn't bring in a private businessman. I told them it was too late. I'd already given my word. I did ask them why not, and no one really had a good answer. <laughs> they did say, well, we've never done it before. And my response was, well, now we will. Let's support our small businesses too. We also asked the local restaurants to figure out how to feed people. No outside food vendors. We wanted to support our restaurants. They made food that was quick and affordable. They also helped with the trash cleanup throughout the event. Now, some restaurants were worried that these places would take away business from them over the weekend. Well, they were wrong. Competition is a good thing. Not everyone wants to eat at a picnic table. Having different offerings actually kept people in town to eat, and the restaurants were all busy during the three-day weekend. You can't have dogs and people in a park together. It's messy. Dogs bark, some dogs bite. It just won't work. Yes, you can. If you ask the dog owners to be responsible, make potty bags available, have conversations with the owners. We didn't have problems at all. Instead, we took their pictures and shared them during the event right online. We tagged the owners. People love seeing their dogs and other people love knowing they could bring their dogs there. We asked the vendors what they'd like, what could be different for them. We had moved downtown because they were rehabbing the park and we wanted to talk to the vendors to see what they wanted. Well, no one had asked them what they wanted before. They were just used to being told what they could and could not do. So I invited a group of nearby local vendors and we met outside on the street, not in a boardroom somewhere. We actually walked the area and they told me they wanted to bring their trailers into their spot. So, you know what I said? Okay, how will you make that happen? If you can make that work, tell me how you'll do it and they planned out the placement of vendors and trailers for the entire event. It was work they were excited to figure out because it made it easier for them. Now comes some fun. I wanna hear about your event. I wanna know what you're doing. Ooh, Duck Derby, Duck Derby, River Duck Races, Shannon. Little plastic ducks with numbers, all released into the river. 
and that's cross the ducks. The first duck to reach the end wins. I love that. Run by the Historical Association. <laughs> and you have an announcer like it's a horse race. And you sell duck whistles. Oh, how much fun is that? Duck Derby. Worried about the plastic. Hmm. I think a lot about making stuff that ends up not being healthy for us and our kids in the long run. So as you're using these plastic ducks and they're all numbered, you catch them all. You make sure you catch them all. And maybe it's a group of volunteers that get to run through the creek of the river, wherever you're hosting it or canoe through it and find any leftover ducks. Kind of solves that problem. Did you give the advent specific time so everything wasn't happening at once? No, they were there all day and you could just walk around and participate in any event. There were not specific time set. The idea was these folks were going to show up around one, two o'clock in the afternoon and stay until after the 10 o'clock news. So people that had specific events going on, they just went on and on and on. Now, the big difference was the bacon eating contest had a specific time. And the chili cook-off took three hours to go through, and we did that early in the afternoon. So by 5 o'clock, people could eat. We're in Iowa, and we get hungry around 5 o'clock. Um, but everything else just went on. By the way, when you, when you are asked to share your idea and, and take part in your idea, you tend to tell more people about it. You tend to market it better. You're on the social media platforms, and you're sharing, hey, we're going to be at this big event. Come join us. It's amazing how that doubles and triples your marketing at no extra expense for you either. Shannon will be happy to send instructions. Yes, please. Um, Shannon, send them to me. I know you gave your email. Send them to me, though, and I'll make sure to put them up on my Facebook page, if that's okay with whoever wrote them. Do we have or use an environmentally responsible sourced shirt company? Ooh, good question. So Google made those shirts, so I can't answer about those t-shirts. But what I can tell you is the first place we look when we do t-shirts is locally. Um, and I know a young man, part-time job, makes t-shirts in his basement. And um, when we say to him, we want to be more environmentally responsible, he will choose the shirts that are for that. There's another t-shirt company in town that does all the school t-shirts. And I can't speak about their practices, but I know they listen really well. So I'm sure if someone went to them, that they'd listen to them as well. Ah, would it be possible to make a gallery walk special by requiring reservations for gallery entries? Ooh, like they do at large museums in the cities. I love that. So you could make it a really kind of wine and dine thing. And you could have, I don't know, six people at a time come through so that they can easily socially distance. That's a great idea. Let me know when you do that. I want to hear about it. Shannon? You've been asked to share more about that battleship strategy. So yes, please do. She gave you her email address. All right, let's see if I missed anything. Ah, Kathleen, they gave away free lunches for students while the skill, ah, the school was getting their mobile lunch program up and running after the clothing is closing of school. It's brilliant. Um, many people depend upon the free lunches at school. Um, sometimes it's the only meal they get. So the fact that you stood in and, and helped make that possible, bravo to you. Great. Oh, voter initiative three days a week. Yay, Kathleen. Good. Um, oh, socially distanced community Easter egg hunt where our team painted 30 paper eggs that we hid all around town and they gave winners gift cards. That's kind of, that's a good idea. Instead of in one little local park where everybody's rubbing shoulders, hide them all over town. I like that. In Albion, ooh, canceled their large annual fall festival. But the local theater hosted Art Hop and Shop. A few local artists featured a small beer tent, beer, beer, and some live music. The local children's museum also hosted a sidewalk chalk, chalk event. The chalk became part of the arts event. Very low cost, very safe and something to do during these challenging times. And you can spread it out. It could be every six feet, literally, where you have your area to go paint. 
Missy organized Taste of the Trails this summer to get people out to explore their trail system. Nordic, but it was summer, so people could walk. And you invited non-skiers to learn about the trails. Folks loved it and wanted to have it at winter, too, a ski-based one. You could do snowshoe walks in the wintertime, too. We do that. Our county conservation does that here. So Beth says, when we buy and make more stuff, eventually it ends up in landfills. The microplastics end up in our water, earth, air, and bodies. Oh, Beth, you and I could talk for hours about that. Um, Becky suggested, what if you made the ducks from scrap wood or recycled paper and get everybody in town involved in doing it? Um, we used to do cardboard boat races where people would make their boats and we'd go out to the one little beach in town and whoever stayed in the water longest <laughs> won the cardboard boat races. Ideally, you would go out and around, but it got um, adjusted to stay in the water long enough using cardboard. Lots of great suggestions here. Wow. Basement. Oh, Charles, there's probably lots of people in town with basement workshops would love to be involved in making those ducks. Just get them a pattern so they're fairly consistent. Great idea. Bunch of people are involved in promoting the event for you because they're making ducks. Oh, that's fun. So social distancing for passing out candy, long pieces of PVC pipe where you could slide the candy down to the treaters. Oh, you guys are awesome. Just awesome. Let's keep going here. Let's go to our next section. Turn things you do into businesses. So what do you do as a hobby or for fun or to help someone? Concrete Washington uses an empty lot for a community garden. Now this brings folks together around a common theme. It also could be a way to feed hungry people, supply food for local restaurants, provide learning for folks who don't know how to garden. All kinds of opportunities here. Now, this is one of my favorite stories. The Old Geezers Club is in Akron, Iowa. They named it that. They've since changed it to the Down Under Club. The retired farmers brought in their equipment so they could work on projects together and teach other people how to use the tools. Now, they're in the basement of a hospital that was later a school and later, lastly, a nursing home, and now it's empty or mostly empty. They have turned the first floor into small businesses. So there's something with health products. There's an artist gallery. I believe there's yoga. And they're expanding as they go. So these guys, the Old Geezers Club, is kind of a maker space. Say I want to build a table, but I don't want to buy all the tools and I don't really know how to use them. I can take my wood to these guys and they would show me how to do that. Perfect place to make some wooden ducks as well. Museum on Main Street is access to the Smithsonian for small town America. And it's through museum exhibitions, research, educational resources, programming. Uh, they've visited 1,600 communities across America since 1994. Sounds like a huge, big project, doesn't it? Well, let's adapt it. You could use your local historical society to do this kind of thing, but make it a bit different. Why not ask the students to come to the museum and choose items to put on display? They can write up the information, create videos, share with the people they know, and get more folks into your museum. And you could do it in an empty building to showcase that as well. This is in Sebring, Ohio. I was there on a walking tour. And we were discussing what if this empty lot was used for dining outside? Maybe bring food trucks in once a week. Set up chairs and tables or picnic tables. Make them socially distant. And you could do that pretty much year round. Might not be able to eat in the wintertime so long. But you could certainly get your food and wait at an empty table. So now let's visit about where do you find these entrepreneurs? Well, at Junkfest kind of events. Now, Junkfest is a local event and it brings in vendors from all over. Do you host these kind of events or have you or in your area? 
Well, walk around and talk to people. Sometimes you'll find a vendor who is ready to share a space or to have a second location, like a winery out in the country, might want to have a spot in town. There might be a small group of folks that are selling their mom's stuff or grandma's stuff and would be interesting in doing a temporary pop-up. Don't confine yourself to just looking for someone to own a building and a business. Etsy. Look on Etsy. I just did a search for Pottery Iowa and found these folks. And I want you to think about what other sites do people sell on. And you can look for your locals there. Wait, locals? <laughs> yes. Start with local people right in your town who are already doing something. Help them. Get them to the next step. I'm going to tell you a story about a local guy in my town. Sean loves kettle corn. He'd make it on his stove and invite friends to come eat it with him. They suggested he sell it. It was that good. In fact, we call it kettle crack. So Sean set up a little tent and a big kettle and made kettle corn in his front yard. Now, I heard about it and asked him to let me know when he made the next batch. He sent out a text to a lot of people saying it was ready and to be there from five to nine or until it was gone. And he used a free texting service to do that. Sean decided that he and his new wife would build a trailer and take it on the road. They went to festivals and fairs and birthdays and weddings and anywhere he could think of to sell kettle corn and lemon shakeups. They did try soup in the winter, but found out people didn't want to carry soup home. It's okay, it was a small step and it didn't work. Better to find out that way instead of putting a ton of money into it. It was at this point I started talking to him about moving into a more permanent place. Funny thing was, they were already having that discussion with another local business. That business had kettle corn for sale in their local coffee shop. And the owner of that coffee shop wanted Sean to buy him out. They worked it out. And today, Sean owns the local coffee shop. And they also give others a chance to try their ideas out too. Wine is for sale from a local winery. They have live music on the weekends, fundraisers for all kinds of organization, and artists work on the wall. God bless Sean. Check out Kickstarter. Now, Brad Martin, who lives in my town, has raised over a quarter of a million dollars on his WTF projects. That stands for Wrench That Fits. He lives in a little house and works out of his garage. He's a particularly good online marketer, too. I share his information as often as I can so others can learn from him. While researching for this presentation, I found my friend Nelson. Back in 2014, he had his first gallery showing, get this, in Harrisville, New Hampshire. He received $743, and his showing was a success. He'd be a great candidate to put his work on a blank wall, wouldn't he? Social media. The Alexander brothers are on Instagram and showcasing their amazing woodworking. They also set up at the annual Christmas event held in sheds in the tiny town of Timberville, Virginia. They sell online too. What could you offer these boys that would entice them to at least share some space on a location? And there are four brothers, all under the age of 30. Kristen Smith posted on her Facebook account, who are the artists in town? And boy, did she get a lot of different answers. She was ready, started gathering her own crowd. And don't forget to ask your friends and family. Who do they know? Ask them if they're doing anything. I'm going to share a gift with you, answer a couple of questions, and talk about liability. So you've just seen ways to gather your crowd around your big idea, suggestions for building connections, and lots of small steps. That, frankly, is idea-friendly. So this is a gift from Becky and me. It's a 30-minute video that shares what the idea-friendly method is and how you can use it in your town. Now, after we're done here, I'm going to be in my booth to chat with you about the tour kit. You can click the expo icon on the left side of your screen and just search for that. 
Then on the right side of your screen, make sure you're in the booth chat, not the general event chat, so you can talk to me. And because you're here, you'll receive a 25% discount if you want to purchase the tour kit from your town. So you can go to saveyour.town forward slash gift and watch the free video on how to be idea friendly. Now let's talk a little bit about viability. Hi, everybody. I am Beth. So one of the most often complaints we get is liability. Liability is too expensive. We can't afford that. It'll never work. Well, that just isn't true. We actually, I'll give you a, an example. We had an event where we had a scissor lift brought down to the event. And a scissor lift has a platform with a gate around it. And it lifts up into the sky so you could see over the buildings. And it was owned by the local construction company. And what they did is it already had liability insurance on it. But to better ensure the safety, they had everybody sign off on a waiver too. That problem was handled. I talked about the insurance company that sponsored the um, human foosball and they provided liability insurance. They were the sponsor for that particular thing so that liability would be covered. You don't always have to provide it yourself. You can get sponsors just for that specific part of the event and be sure to promote them and share that they're making it possible for those things to be there. And I also tell people, check your own insurance. Look into it further. Call your guy or your gal and find out maybe you have insurance already that might cover it or the writer is inexpensive enough to pick up. So don't, don't be stopped by liability. It's, it's enough to make you crazy. Yeah. All right. Let's talk in the crowd here. Beth is doing an online sister circle, new moon. Is that today or yesterday? And would like to start something locally. Anybody have ideas for her? I don't even know what an online sister circle is. Yeah, Becky asked, didn't I also find a way to extend the Chamber's insurance for activities at events? That's exactly what we did. So um, because of our small town local insurance agent, um, we made sure that we had insurance built into our policy to cover outside events out of our office. And it was relatively inexpensive and certainly worth it. Nathan said, I was able to do that often. Add as additional insured. Great idea. Let's see. Freddie, we added picnic tables to a green space in our downtown area to increase outdoor seating during the pandemic and provided a hand sanitizing, sanitizing station for the area. Great idea. Positive feedback from both patrons and restaurant owners. I love that you're going to make that an annual summertime activity too. People like to eat outside. They like to visit with their friends. Um, so it's always nice when you, you make that available. At some of our events, what we actually found was we got a hold of a big tent. Somebody loaned us a huge tent and we put picnic tables underneath it. And the local bank gave out free ice water, um, bottled water. And that was really helpful too. It gave a, an area where people that needed to sit down could sit down and provide something to drink as well. And we always invite the EMT folks to come with their truck down and showcase what it is they do and be available if there's any emergencies. Let's see, Kate Easter. Lots of races, wow. Big, big events like World Cup every couple of years, Fat Tire Festival. Ooh, in conjunction with the local brewers in the summer, that makes sense. They do smaller hiking and trail running races for those of us non-bikers. Winter snowshoeing, skiing, weekly snow when it's not freezing as well. Um, I've seen some uh, canes, a perfect example. Your local uh, shoe store there sponsored a virtual race. So you could go run the race and submit your time. I don't know if you had to take a picture while you were doing it or not, but they made it possible so that people could still race, but do it virtually and be involved as a group over the weekend. I love that. Um, trick or treating into helping others. Children who bring non-perishable canned goods or 50 cents to a drop off place receive a candy treat and all proceeds go to the local food pantry. Sharon Beaver shared that. You know, when, um, 
back in April, uh, we wanted to start um, bringing people out, but we weren't quite sure, a group of us, just friends, weren't quite sure how to go about that. So we decided to do a drive around and just ask people to show up at six o'clock at the parking lot downtown and dress up your car any way you want to. And the first night there were over 50 people there. I was great. And we just drove around town. Uh, the second Friday, we did this every Friday. Um, the second Friday, uh, it was raining and nasty weather and cold. And there were five of us. But guess what? We still drove around. It was great. And because we could social distance, wear our masks, not actually be in contact with other humans, but feel like part of an event, this actually picked up. We, we decided to, well, let's do canned goods for the local food pantry. And um, the local guys came down from the pantry with a trailer and filled that, people filled that trailer up. Um, the last one that we did was to honor the high school students. So instead of um, putting them in a location on display and people drove around them, we asked the high school students, get in your cars, dress up any way you want to, prom outfit, whatever you want, and drive around. And there were locations around town where people could go park, be socially distant, and see all the students that were driving around. There were over 100 people that participated in the driving portion only, and all the locations around town were filled up. None of this cost us anything. Of course, we invited the fire department, the police department. There were sirens going off. It was crazy. We drove through the parking lots of the nursing homes. It was really a great time and brought a lot of spirit to the community. That's something you can do that socially distance. Let's see. Globalsisterhood.org. Thank you, Beth. Yep, Becky, I did. I took the cost of added insurance, split it up, and found sponsors that covered it for, for adding that to our policy. There we go. Emily chips in. The virtual 5K was a huge success in King. They raised over $20,000 with all the proceeds going to local businesses. The coffee shop that she manages received enough money from the event to buy them, themselves an e-bike to make local coffee bean deliveries to folks home and businesses. I love that. King's kind of a great deal, a big deal, isn't it? I had a good time when I was there, and I'm glad to see you doing so many awesome stuff. Snoga, yoga in the snow. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. How do you do that? Aren't you packed up? I mean, covered in so many clothes that it would be hard to do the positions. <laughs> uh, I crack myself up sometimes. Does anyone, I know it's 930. We have another 15 minutes or so. Um, if you would like to ask more questions, I'm here and Becky's in the audience. Thank you, Becky, um, to participate. We'd love to answer your questions. Oh, Caribou, Maine did a virtual 5K. Very cool. Local bike club did an amazing virtual event for a month. Collected info via Strava. STRVA, awards for miles ridden, raffle tickets based on how many miles, elevation gain, comp as long as a single ride. That's the longest single ride. Great idea. Look for the Fremont Area Road Tour. Get some details about what they did. Sharon, thank you. It's a lot of information for sure. Um, I'm I think, Emily, are we ready to wrap this up? Give people a chance to go refill their coffee cups or water or whatever it is that they're they're drinking and get ready for the next session. Yes, that sounds great. Uh, I don't really want this session to end, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to do it again, huh? Yeah, this has been so wonderful. Thank you to all who have uh, attended and and entered into the chat. It was so lively and positive. Uh, thank you so much, Deb. I'm so glad you joined us again this year. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So everybody go to the expo, look for me, Deb, or filling empty buildings. There's all kinds of stuff over there. And I'll meet you in the expo chat. Um, thank you so much for everybody being here. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon for our next uh, new ruralism making it on Main Street session at 11.